you okay? Is this working? Someone's just stuck their hand up at the back. <laughs> yes. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking to Bill Nace, guitarist and improviser. You might have seen him last night with Ceylon Mange, Ceylon Monge, Main, Ceylon Mange with Dylan Newkiss and Karen Constance. He runs a great record label as well called Open Mouth, uh, Philly based. Used to play with, uh, Bill's played with all sorts of people. Uh, used to be Massachusetts based, played with people like Jake Majinski and probably millions of others as well. With Body Head, with Kim Gordon, who you recently did a residency at Cafe Oto in London. That was a big kind of several day event. And you might well have um, seen them yesterday as well. So um, how, how's your task going so far, Bill? Great. That's a great Is answer. This on? Can you hear Bill okay? I think we need a mic. Do we it need a mic? It goes back a little way, so let's let's do it with mics let's and see mic. and see how it goes. Okay. Alex, you want to help me? We were talking like last night about like videos and stuff and uh I sent you some I sent you a footwork vid. Did you uh did you enjoy that one? I'd seen that video, yeah, I oh love that video. Yeah. It it's a classic from yeah, it's great. back in the day with uh some some insane dance action and uh, insane beats as well. Yeah. But talking of videos, like I was trying to persuade you uh, to send like maybe a video of some guitarists or some guitarists you kind of thought were interesting or you know in the music journalism sort of terms like influential or whatever, and you were like, oh, I don't, I don't know about that. I don't know like about sending a video. But then you had to think about. I mean, it I could send videos all day. It's not. It's more just. Um, I think if you get to that place to talk about that organically, it's cool. But I think if you s kind of start with something like that, it immediately frames what you do in a kind of context. And then people, I think the most room you can leave for people to project their own experience onto it is, is uh, the best. Well, we, you did eventually send a video. We could start with a video. We could start with some chat. What would You're be the boss. Well, the video looks super cool, so maybe let's... I'll start with the video. Okay, cool. Let's start with a super cool video. Could you just run the, run the video, please? So this is the monks with their famous monks haircuts live in Germany. I've never seen this before. I heard about it from like you, but uh, that's wild what they're doing with the guitar. Yeah, when I was just you trying to think of this? something... Um, uh, you know, obviously now videos are... You could spend the whole day on YouTube watching videos like that, but... I was trying to think of something that I saw when I was younger that kind of, you know, I grew up in New Jersey, which was kind of a cultural void okay. pre-internet. So it's like, <clears throat> you know, little things like that that kind of come your way via like a VHS tape or w whatever are like enormous. Um, you know, yesterday, like I was chatting with Marian Rezai, turntablist, and like she won thing which kicked her off was like this video she saw of like DMC scratch championships in like oh, yeah, 1991 yeah. and it's a bit like you it's like you know living you didn't have everything at your fingertips and so she just like she was just like shit watching it again and again and like trying to find everything about it oh and yeah see I've watched this video so many yeah or just like you know um you know it used to be you wouldn't even know what a band looked like you know or you maybe you saw a little clip of the Stooges and it was like huge um now it's i think people interact with that stuff differently but this was a big one for me so when did you how did you discover it like what, what kind of channel did you find i don't even like? remember to be honest okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then they're doing the wild shit with the guitar as well yeah i mean i like that it's just not pr it's not really precious they're they're having fun with it um Obviously, I'd, you know, I'd seen people stick things in the strings before, but just like putting it on the floor and just kind of banging on it. I loved how primitive it was. And I don't know if I've seen like lots of people do. I've seen like people doing guitar on the, on the floor before, but I've never seen like several people doing it at once. Like maybe mo more people. Maybe we need to get back to that. Maybe yeah. we need to. That could be like a, a, a new a new kind of trio. Yeah. Uh, yes, yeah, it's, it's it's pretty great. Like, well, um, were you playing guitar at the time anyway? Um, I started playing bass when I was like 
12, and then I switched to guitar. Um, 20, when I was like 22, yeah. And did bands come, you said you didn't know what bands kind of looked like, did you, you know, did bands come naturally at that stage? Um, well, I guess that goes back to just the idea of having room to like project onto things. I think now, um, I don't know if it's a, uh, you know, I don't know if it's a way to cut through all the noise because there's so much information. Um, but now I, I feel like you're kind of told what to think about everything before you even get a chance to hear it. Um, you know, one sheets have gotten way more full of hyperbole um, <laughs> and everything's kind of um, put in a historical context for you and what bands you're supposed to think of when you listen to this band. And um, it's not bad, I just think it's... Um, it can be bad. It can be. I mean, it's, uh, you know, um, but I think, you know, when I, there was something for me just that was formative with the mystery of that, like sending away um, stamps for catalogs and you would just get a list and, you know, what, like, oh, what's Handful of Dust? That sounds interesting. I'm gonna yeah, check, yeah, yeah. You know, um, Might that have been like the Forced Exposure catalog at the time or something different? I would send the way to, yeah, Forced Exposure. Um, Matador actually had a good one oh. at the time because they were distributing. Um, um, but then just like noise, noise label, cassette labels, you know. Um, yeah. For me, that was just a... Um, I think having that space to kind of project onto that was more interesting. Uh-huh. Those kind of one-sheet things are a pain in the ass sometimes. Like, speaking as a music journalist, you get a lot of things sent to you, and um, I'll just reel off some of the things which people get compared to all the time. Like, Arthur Russell, stuff gets compared to Arthur Russell all the time, whether it's a disco track or some country thing. People always love to get that in, like, Lee Perry, people get compared to Lee Perry, even if they're some kind of like indie kind of groove type band. And it just, the whole thing with like how people describe does put this frame around them and it does like stifle debate. And um, what do you, what, you know, when, when you're sending some stuff out or like, like, with, like Body Head, for instance, which is quite a high profile group, like, where, do you sort of say, don't describe us, don't describe us as anything or? Um, like when I'm sending stuff, like one sheets for the, my label or? One sheets or, for your label and, you know, if something's getting sent out mentioning you as an artist, do you uh, try and keep it mysterious? No, I don't, um, I don't try to control it or anything, but, um, you know, the one sheets that have been written for Bodyhead specifically, we, we've asked those people, so I think they know where we're coming from. Uh -huh. okay, okay, okay. Um, and then for my label, yeah, it's usually just, I usually ask people that are, to do it that are somehow related to the project. Um, and it's usually, can, it's usually pretty abstract, they're just informational, it's not, it's not, um, it's not a big uh, mile long thing of just hyperbole. Did you hear about this bit of journalism which started doing the rounds about a week ago, written by Simon Reynolds, quite an established journalist, about his thing which he called Concept Tronica, mm -mm. which is kind of conceptual electronica. And his argument is loads of electronic stuff is just getting too filtered through, you know, the ideas are coming from before, the ideas are coming before the music, so you'll get some uh, some electronic record which is all about, I don't know, um, you know, the collapse of capitalism in Western Europe, but it'll be like just some kind of like banging techno or something, you know. I think that's a way to cut, I think, I mean, that's just conceptualism though. I mean, that's always a danger of, or not a danger, it's just a thing to balance with conceptualism, um, like not getting ahead of yourself. Not getting ahead of yourself. Um, I actually don't read a lot of music journalism. I don't really enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> that's your, that's valid. I'm not going to, I mean, man, like artists have got enough that, time that's on not hands a trying to actually <laughs> just do the art. So Yeah, I'm, I'm just, I, my time spent on trying to make the music, I don't really, 
uh, yeah, it's it's rare for me to read it where I feel like it's adding to it. I usually feel like it's um, making it feel smaller to me. But sometimes back in the day when you'd have those catalogs of um, <coughs> music, you know, things like forced exposure or like maybe Matador and so on, that are like people writing about it and enthusing about it. And, yeah. and you'd be like, oh shit, I've got to hear this. This really sounds, you know, I haven't heard it yet, but if it lives up to what's written down there, it's, it, it's got to be worth hearing, you know. I remember things like that with like handful of dust and stuff like that. Yeah, like, Whoa, but that was like such blasted. a small pool of people. Now it's like there's so much to wade through. Like, or, or is there anyone that you like that you feel like writes like that now? I mean, I like uh, mm. I like crafting's yes. writing. Well, obviously Byron is. That was going to be one of my first um, mentions was Matt Crafting, who's this writer, in Massachusetts, and what what I love about. Maybe this is a detour, but maybe it's not. But like, what I love about his writing is just this sheer enthusiasm, and like, you can just sense this love coming through for oh, it. Yeah. You know, whether it's Lou Reed or some some people just pissing about. With yeah, some, he's a deep listener for yeah, sure. Yeah, for sure, for yeah. sure. I could tell. Can I can I tell you a bit of like Byron Coley anecdote, Please. which is so Byron Coley is like you know long established journalist. These days in Massachusetts, where Bill has some big links, and um, you know, so so the next issue of the Wire, we've got an interview with um, Hal Gelb, who's this guy from Giant Sand, yeah, yeah. In Tucson, Arizona, and um, and they got chatting in this interview about Byron Coley, and Hal Gelb, this artist, was saying, "Man, I love Byron Coley's writing. You know, I loved his negative reviews, and uh, I was always trying to send stuff to Byron Coley, and uh, he'd always review it." But it always give it positive reviews. I always wanted to get a negative review. Yeah, he doesn't really so. do that anymore. I no, mean, I think no. that a lot of that was just them having fun. No. Yeah. But he doesn't really... I think there's so much stuff out, it just feels like a waste for him to spend time being negative about something. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, how did your gig go last night with Dylan and Karen and in here? I loved it. In here? Yeah. I just looked up... Um, I couldn't remember when we did our record, and it was 14 years ago, so it was... 14? <laughs> yeah. Whoa. Um, yeah, so it was pretty... It was great to be able to be on stage with them again. And what's, what's the name all about, Ceylon? I think Alan Bishop named that. Is Dylan here? Hey, right? Hey, Dylan, what's this name all about? Yeah, he just said we were having a band, and do you have any names? And he sent a list, and that was the one we picked. I figured like Ceylon was like a kind of tea reference or something. Uh -huh. Okay, Alan Bishop. And uh, one thing I thought was kind of interesting about it was like, <clears throat> you know, you guys played for like 45 minutes, but you didn't look at each other at all until right at the end when like, you know, you figured it was over and you gave Dylan a kind of like, you know, friendly smile just like you'd done there, like to sort of say, Oh, no, I just heard something, and I looked over, and Dylan said, overs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So if, if it's 14 years, have you had deep links with, you know, kind of uh, that part of the UK underground for that long? Well, I lived in Brighton for a year. Um, oh, okay. So that's how I met them. When was that, Bill? <clears throat> I want to say 2002. Um, yeah, I'd moved to Western Mass in, like, 99. And then... Yeah, it was kind of a weird... I dropped out of school. I wanted to try to do music mm -hmm. full-time, but then started kind of second-guessing that. And then I thought maybe I'd get into printmaking or something. Um, and then, like, any 22-year-old who's not sure what they're doing, I followed my girlfriend over to Brighton. And, um, yeah, that's when I met Dylan and Karen. Uh-huh. But it was a big, um, like I started doing visual art, which I'd never done before. They were just really supportive and kind of like, yeah, just really supportive. And I kind of got back into music in a different way. And then when I went back to Western Mass, from that experience, it was a really kind of rebirth sounds grandiose, but it was like a really good it was a re time for me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and, um, and then when I got back to Western Mass, it was a just really interesting time there. Like... A lot of people that had been there for a while start um, were starting music projects, like kind of all at the same time, like um, Magic Markers, Fat Worm of Error, um, Corsana was 
playing with Flaherty, and then we started a duo. Yeah, that, I mean, that was an interesting scene. Maybe let's talk about that for a little yeah. quick moment. But, like, you know, we have some really big and, like, uh, well-established personalities there, like, like Paul Flaherty and, like, uh, I guess Byron Coley and maybe... I don't know, Michael Ayler's from Aramite. Oh, from Aramite, maybe. yeah. He's not there anymore, but yeah, oh, he, okay. he used to do a series called Fire in the Valley there, which was amazing. I mean, I saw so much stuff there that I wouldn't have seen anywhere else. What were the hot spots and the kind of interesting venues where lots of stuff happened? <clears throat> so much stuff came out of that time. Yeah, I mean, it's a small town. It's a really small town. Um, and this was in Northampton? or Well... Oh, no. Northampton, yeah, but there's a whole cluster of towns around Northampton. So, I mean, I kind of think of it all as one area. It's called yeah. the Valley, but um, Northampton itself actually didn't have. It had a couple venues, but things were always like all the venues in this scene. Like, they shut down after a year, and then you have to find something else. Um, so it was moving around a lot, but um, you know, Crafting was doing uh, that group Son of Earth, and they they were booking a lot of shows in Hampshire, so they would kind of get bigger things because they had a budget and da 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 da. That was kind of connected a little bit tangentially to some university type thing, wasn't it? Hampshire so, College, yeah. Yeah, so they had some sort of budget for just putting on some things, yeah. like having a little stage yeah. and stuff. Yeah, but like there's that. a big house scene, like house show oh, yeah. scene in Northampton, and then um, bars that pop up for a while, but then kind of get tired of hosting this kind of stuff. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I, I kind of still think of that as my home in a way. It, it was a really, I think having a small space like that to uh, work on music um, was really good for me. Uh, the Why I did this piece about some of the connected <clears throat> bands at that time, this issue in the early 2000s, like, you know, which we coined in a music journalism way, the new weird America. I remember. <laughs> and then, like, um, about six months ago, or no, not six months ago, a couple of months ago, it's in this magazine at the front, Matt Crafting kind of revisited that scene and wrote about it. Yeah, again. so I think he was nervous about, because um, it's just been a, you know, trying to fit a kind of 15 year thing into a. Yeah. I think it was a little daunting. And I think everyone has their kind of own perspective or entryway into that. See, even though it's really small, they, um, I, I think he did a good job, though. But you're right, it is hard to, to sum up a scene in, like, 2,000 words, to sum up 10 years. Well, it's, it's continuing in 2,000 words. It's super, super hard. And one thing which he kind of talked about is, like, well, you know, the, the, the why I did call it New Weird America at the time. And there was a lot of folky influences, and there were a lot of, you know... There was definitely some weirdness going on. But was that down, specifically but... Western Mass, or was that just kind of like... It was sort of... That was like Sunburn and Western Peachy Six mass. and stuff like that, right? All, also those kind of people. Yeah, well. right, right. But the kind of main thing he touched upon was just how open it was, that you'd sure, have like sure. rock bands doing stuff with like improvisers. Well, I think that was more... I, I think, in my experience, that was kind of everywhere in the early 2000s. I think the... Um, Curation was a little more interesting with mm. um, with shows. I think you could have, you know, like someone like White Magic, and then a harsh noise thing, and then you know a, a full on band. And I think now you tend to get um, more of like the same thing. Uh huh. You like know, like if I'm playing with say a violin player, then it's like three other. Guitar, string, violin, string combo. Yeah. extravaganza, yeah. I, I, I know what you mean. It's not bad. I just think there's more of an exchange that happens or it's just more interesting to kind of see these connections between things that maybe you didn't yeah. think were there until you kind of see them live. You know what? I'd sort of attempt to turn that around in a kind of positive way, which I'd sort of say, I think, a lot of the things which happened somewhere like in Massachusetts <coughs> in the early 2000s, has become like massively influential on the way things are programmed now. And in, in some ways, it feels like some of those ideas have like won. Because if you think about how central the idea of like just improvisation is to loads of bands and artists now, you you get like you could have an evening where you have like one 
finger picking guitar player, but then you'll have like one. Um, Thanks a lot, Ali. Okay. Sorry. Ali, Ali, is Ali usually that organized? Just does whatever he wants. <laughs> anyway, the point I was getting at is I think in some ways some of those ideas have won. You know, everyone improvises, everyone's up for a, getting down with some fucking around with some pedals and some noise and mm -hmm. stuff like that. I don't know, just to give that scene some props, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, um, like, Color Out of Space, um, there's a festival in Kentucky called Cropped Out. Um, called Cropped Out? Yeah. I think they're, I do like, not know the, that. the programming is, like, excellent, and it's just kind of all over the place. And um, there's a really good one called Troglobottom, which is um, Juclo Duo and Metabolismus. Okay. Um, Another festival somewhere else? That's in southern Germany, yeah. Oh, but okay, just okay. just ones that I've played recently, where it kind of reminds me of that, like more of like more of a reflection of what the underground actually is. Yeah. It's not. I, I think um, I do think with the with the internet, I, I kind of thought at one point that maybe genre would kind of be destroyed a little. I think it has in some corners, but it's also gotten way more. Um, strict and yeah. even more like micro scene within micro scene um, which is kind of uninteresting things always like mix themselves up and then they like congeal or <coughs> solidify again don't they like, right right you might have some festival which is like oh you know we're all genres but that in itself becomes a kind of banner or something like that and so yeah i think it's an understandable way too to deal with how much just information is coming in every day yeah. too so when you're in western mass were you you were starting out on your thing maybe in your sort of you know early-ish or mid-20s like were you starting to play like who what kind of people were you playing with and were you doing many solo gigs because I, I noticed about you that <clears throat> maybe you don't tend to do too many solo things um, this tour I'm doing now is mostly solo. Um, I used to, I used to play solo way more, um, mm -hmm. and then I'm getting back at it more. Um, well, I was doing a trio called XO4 that was um, Jake McGinsky, yeah. and it, it was initially just me and uh, this guy John Trzinski, uh duo. He he's a, m mainly plays drums now. He's a duo with Steve Gunn. Yes, um, and. Yeah, we started trying to do prepared guitar together. There was a store near us. It was like a junk shop, and they uh, had all this hardware that was like for a dollar, and we just bought a ton of it and tried to kind of come up with like a language for ourselves for it, so like different, you know, techniques that we could do to get this certain sound or whatever, and we weren't using pedals, but we also weren't, I wasn't, I was trying to not listen to too much, too many other prepared guitarists because I... Um, totally, because then you just stop. I just didn't want to get the... I remember the first day we did something and we were like, well, that, that's cool. And then we heard AMM and I was like, oh, shit. Uh, <laughs> so I just, I wanted to just give myself a chance to just explore it without like reacting to yeah. outside. And your own language, as you say. Yeah, yeah. Um, but then, obviously, that changed, and I started. So you're trying to do it the same every time, like you know, oh, we'll put the uh, yeah. bulldog clip in this position. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What kind of, you know, what what kind of cool cool shit did you come up with in terms of how to prepare a guitar? <laughs> you know, uh, I don't know. You'd have to look online. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. It's lost in the midst of time. <laughs> After after the gig last night, which was it was like very it's like super hypnotic and it had these like beautiful loops, and um, I don't know if it's maybe you're all using kind of slightly different tapes or something, but it had this like really thick texture. But anyway, we were chatting afterwards, and you were sort of saying you were talking about '90s hip hop, and you were saying like '90s hip hop and is a big influence on what you do. I wonder if you could just expand on that. I think just it's another. It's just another music that uses loops in an interesting way. But I think especially the early 90s stuff. Um, 
you know, it was like when the MPC came out, it was kind of interesting. Anytime there's like a new technology like that, and then you get to see different people's personality on it. And there were so many just, you know, people like DJ Premier, Pete Rock. Um, yeah, it's, I, I think that's, it's odd that that stuff isn't talked about more in the, in the same frame with like electronic music or electronic composers. Um, Cause I think it actually has a lot in common. <clears throat> Maybe in some ways there's a kind of a bit of a generational thing. Like um, a while back, The Wire did this um, issue called like Retromania, which is all about, uh, oh sorry, retroactivity, which is all about, uh, my mistake, it was all about how lots of people were using older musics and sort of in a new context. And I wrote something in that which, where I was trying to kind of talk about how like loads of people in the kind of late 2000s or like using hip hop because, or the ideas of hip hop, maybe because they'd grown up with it, but you'd have like, uh, people like, you know, like the Not Not Fun label or something like that on the West Coast, they'd like have lots of stuff which could be like kind of an indie type thing, but could have like a really heavy beat mm -hmm. to it in some way. Or uh, Daniel Lopatin on the Atrix Point Never, he would talk a lot about, oh, you know, I really want to kind of use my music to kind of like get back to those textures that she heard in like Akai samplers in the 1000s. So maybe in some ways it's a generational thing, I guess. Yeah, for me, I think it's just any, you know, it's not that different than like um, Terry Riley or No Good, which is a one of my favorite record or tracks. And a very heavy record for sure. Yeah, and then, um, you know, Dillaway. I mean, uh, um, I just think something where the, loops are interesting because you can cut them in a certain way where like to me Dillaway's music is this I can just go so deep with that but then you can hear another person do loops and it's just maddening and kind of a little circus sounding so I well, think I it's something where Dillaway the loop can be really good but also maddening and a bit circus and sounding. in such a good way though in I love such it a good yeah way. he's amazing um, I guess also with that kind of thing like you had the 90s hip-hop producers but then in the 2000s, you suddenly had this explosion of like really cool effects pedals where before effects pedals were like, I don't know, three or four seconds, or all of a sudden you can get effects pedals which are like 20, and all of a sudden that can be your orchestra for making music, you know? Yeah, I, 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 I kind of like junk, junky loops better. I think, uh -huh. I think there, was, um, there was definitely a time like in the early 2000s where it was that, that like green line six pedal. That, that was um, everywhere. Everyone had, and it was. I think limitations are helpful. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of times, those things, it's just stack, 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 stack. You know, and you're not actually, you're not hearing a loop or experiencing it or have this kind of. It's more just a. Um, it's more just like too many people walking through the doorway at once, kind of. <laughs> What's your favorite like loop pedals or loop? Devices? I don't even use. Um, well, I have loop cassettes that I use with Dylan and Karen. Um, and when we did the record, I actually added like a reel-to-reel -reel I would use. And then I plugged that in after we had made the record and it caught on fire. And I never, <laughs> I never got a new one. But I only use a, I only use a loop pedal with, uh, with Kim because uh -huh. we don't have a drummer and it's just kind of a way to have a pulse. But I, I just have this thing that does like 30 seconds. You can't layer. Um, it's pretty, pretty basic. How did the hookup with Kim come about? Um, well, they moved to Western Mass the same year that I did. So they were just, you know, it's a small scene. Um, and they kind of slowly became part of it. Um, so I actually met Thurston first, and we had, a, we had a duo for a while. And then we started playing as a trio. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then, you know, everything happened, and then... Mm -hmm. I kept playing with Kim. With Kim, okay. Uh, why named Body Head? Um, you know, it falls into that kind of, there's a lot of space to project onto that. For sure. Um, we got it out of a book about Catherine Briot's films. About who? Catherine Briot, she's like oh. a French filmmaker. Tell me more. Um, I'm trying to think of that. She did a movie called Fat Girl. Um, Brief Crossing, but just deals a lot with sexuality. 
disconnection. Um, and it was just, but it was just a cool line that was in this book about her that we took it. And um, you said about like using the pedals and stuff. Does that extend to like body head records <coughs> as well? That I mean, are they just completely improvised? That a stupid question, but yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, we get asked that a lot. People don't seem to want to think that it's totally improvised. I mean, yes. you know, you can't, you yes. can't, um, I think there's that, a... It's like imp improvising day after day after day. Man, it's not necessarily easy. No, but you're still yourself, you know? I mean, you're still going to come back to things that you have done before. You know, I think the idea of, like, free improv is kind of... <clears throat> In my, it's a little romantic in my mind. I agree. It's Actually, uh, to use a like kind of hip hop analogy, like when you talk, when people talk about hip hop, they talk a lot about like rappers who like freestyle and stuff. And then when you actually get into hip hop, rappers are very rarely freestyling. And that's no. Oh, yeah, you hear them use them. the same. Yeah, yeah. They're, you know, they're, they're, they're always trying to enter into, you know, something they've done before and make it better and stronger and flip sure. it. And so sure. On. And in some ways, I think it is the idea of complete freedom. It can be like really romantic. I think it's kind of like a male like cowboy thing, you know. It's <laughs> like a. I don't think it's. I think it's an ideal, and it's like yeah, something to like maybe reach towards. But I think that you're always yourself, you know, um, and you can kind of push at that. And I think that's where the that's when things kind of get interesting. But I don't think there's like a way to fully get away from that. You're, you're always gonna sound like you in a certain way. But I think that's where improvising with, in other combos gets interesting because you can kind of be framed in, in different ways, frame, you know, you frame the person you're playing with in different ways, you can kind of push at each other and then it kind of turns the vantage point a little, how you're hearing it. I think that's, um, for me, when it gets interesting. Does like, I mean, you must have played with him, I reckon, like 200 or more times or something like that. I don't know. But like, does, does it change more as you get more and more and more familiar? Or is it, does it? We'll have down? shows where I'm like, oh, that was so different than anything we've done. And then one that reminds me of something we did here. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's more like kind of A to C and then back to B. And then, you know, it's, I think that's more how things progress. Um, but yeah, there's, a, you know, I, I always like to also just stay in a space as long as I can and really explore it and not feel like it constantly needs to, um, to just be changing all the time, you know, like make sure that I really stayed in a space and explored what that was. Talk of that like sense. curation and stuff. You talked about curation. So you did this like residency at Cafe Oto in East London like you know when you're faced with like okay we've got a couple of days like you know what can we make happen you know what did you how did you go how did you two and you know the people organizing it go about that and what did you come up with fielding suggest I, I suggested um I suggested Dylan and Karen and um he he just sent a list of people and you know, some of them I knew, some of them I didn't, and then kind of just narrowed it down. But it was he he has more of an idea of what the what that scene is, so I just kind of was it was fine like deferring to him for that. But but if we're somewhere where we know someone or we there's someone that we think would be fit well, then we we usually pick the openers. Any like memorable matchups or kind of collisions over those two or three two or three days? Um, yeah, it was all good. <laughs> uh, we've been doing, we've been doing, um, like double duo tours with Gun Trzinski and those have been really, yeah. um, like kind of what I was saying earlier, like we don't sound alike at all, but there are kind of these, um, similarities that come out once you start doing that over, over a period of time. So those have been, we, you know, did a leg out West did an East Coast one. I think we're going to do a Midwest one in April. So th those have been, it's, that's been a cool thing to kind of come back to like every six months and revisit. 
And, and like Body Head, that's an interesting duo because like Gun does some like really straight up stuff and yeah. he does some wild guitar stuff and then he does this improv stuff as well. I guess it, it's a bit like him who, you know, will do something which is a bit like a kind of lo-fi pop track but also Body Head and also a million. Oh yeah, they're as well. such a good duo to watch. Yeah, really good. And they've been playing together for such a long time. Um, so you can kind of, you can kind of feel the chemistry. Yeah. Is, might there be like anything, because you've, you've been so prolific, you've been such a, like a mainstay in connecting lots of different groups and stuff together quite recently and touring so fucking much. Is, is there like any sort of solo recording type project on the horizon for you? Yeah, or? I just finished the solo record. Uh -huh. um, I mean, I, I had put out just kind of live guitar tapes here and there, but um, for whatever reason, I just... Um, the solo thing was kind of daunting. So what did you... How did you go about it? And what did you end up doing? Well, this was an interesting one because I... For me, because I kind of gave up a lot of control for it, which was... Um, uh -huh. I really like to mix records, so it was a little um, nerve-wracking. But I tracked it about a year ago in Chicago. Um, and this guy, Cooper Crane... From you know Bitch in Bar. House yeah, and Cave. Things. Yeah. yeah. And um, he produced uh, Circuit They Use last record, which yeah. I love. Um, so I kind of tracked with him. And then we started to do some mixing, kind of putting stuff on the, some loop tapes and just kind of talking about what I wanted to do with it. And then him and Haley uh, mixed it. Uh, of Sir Haley of Circuit. Yeah. You, yeah right, okay. um, so it was kind of a strange experience for me, but it was... Right, that's was, quite a meeting of people. and. We we did like kind of tape stuff or guitar stuff or all of those all things. live guitar uh, all live guitar yeah it was just after we we were putting some of it onto tape to just kind of fool around with saturating it in a, in a different way ah, okay that's unexpected yeah and it exciting hopefully <laughs> uh, we've got a tiny bit of time left does anyone want to throw any questions at Bill at all. Stick your hand up in the back if you wanted to. Hey, hi, Joe, go ahead. Why, why guitar? Because I wanted to play guitar initially. I just started bass because my friends were in a band and they needed a bass player. Um, so, yeah, I was just relieved of my duties so I could move on the guitar. All good. Anyone else? Uh, there's one at the front, but I'll do the one at the back first. Shout it out. Um, would um, Body Head try to do a collaboration with the Necks? With the Necks? <laughs> Are the Necks in the room? Is Tony here? Um, I'm just thinking of the names alone. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> good shout, man. Yeah, well. Um, yeah, sure. The neck connects oh, I get the it. body. Oh, uh, I'm way behind. That's fantastic. Uh, at the front here, yeah. I was. Do you have a? Do you have a current fame with an internet meme? What's uh, this? Um, I don't know anything about it. Do you know anything about it? Don't be shy. No, I know what it is. Uh, so on John Olson's Twitter account, Bill Instagram, Bill is there. I'm not on social media really, so I think they like that. Like his <laughs> his followers don't even know what, what who Wolf Eyes is, so let alone who I am. So I think they think it's hilarious that uh, you know people seem to have feelings about it. But uh, yeah, I don't know. Okay. It's so stupid. <laughs> no, well, you say that, but I'll be checking that out in approximately three minutes. Uh, I'm going to throw one more question at you. Yeah, yeah. Um, we haven't talked about your label that much. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, I, was gonna, I mean, this isn't a question, but do you do the artwork for the label as well? Most, mostly, yeah. yeah. Um, it's real nice. Once in a while, if I, feel like, um, if I feel like it wouldn't fit the music or... Um, or like, um, like I just did one with Samara Lubelski mm. and her boyfriend does these amazing um, kind of typewriter art. 
Um, so if there's something like that where it's just organically like makes sense, then we'll do that. But yeah, m mostly I do it. Um, I feel like it gives it. Um, I just like labels like that that have kind of they feel like a world yeah. onto themselves a little, and I think. I think kind of having slightly uniform art like that um, can kind of add to that. So, so it creates the the walls of that world, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Do you uh, uh, do you, do you have any advice for anyone who has a record label or would be thinking of starting one? Don't do it. <laughs> no, um, I don't know. It's I don't. Um, I, you know, the labor of love thing is so cliche, but it really is like, it's not like I make any money off of it. I, for me, it was really just, <clears throat> um, a way to feel like, I liked being my own gauge for whether I thought something was interesting enough to put out or good enough to put out or, um, and there was a lot of stuff happening in Western Mass that wasn't being documented, so, um, yeah, there was just something kind of empowering about not waiting on someone else to come say, this is good enough to be out in the world, you know, and just kind of do it myself. Um, yeah. Empowering for sure. Okay, we'll leave, we'll leave it there. Let's say thanks to Bill cool, for thank you. hanging out. Thanks. <laughs> thanks, man. Stick around for the Tusk films starting in a bit. Uh, if you want a copy of Mag, come and get one. Thanks, have a great Tusk.